Greetings War Thunderers, this is Longshot with you again, and in this video I'll be looking at surviving stock syndrome when flying the Fokkerwolf 190D9. If you look at this plane, its beautiful lines speak of speed and deadly efficiency. It just looks like an apex predator, and when its upgrades are fully researched, that's exactly what it is in War Thunder. The D9 is a phenomenal plane. But that's far from the case when it's in stock condition. Everything outperforms you, you've got some work to do before unlocking its true potential. I myself hadn't flown the D9 before making this video, so for me too this was a learning process, and so this video shows my real experience with this stock plane, warts and all. So to start with, let's look at the plane's armour. The pilot's well protected from most angles. The x-ray shows the fuel tanks directly underneath and behind the pilot, where they're protected by the lower layer of armour plating. Ok, let's see how she flies as a stock plane. I'll start with the roll rate, which is very fast, as is typical of the 190s. I'll fly smoke and see how it goes in a horizontal turn to test the strength of its elevators. Now a fighter with good turning capability has a small turning circle and can usually catch its smoke trail. But the 190 circle is huge and the smoke disappears long before it can reach it. One positive though, it didn't lose much speed in the turn. Now I'm using left rudder and up elevator together, tapping the right roll key to stop the plane tipping over, and hitting web to power up into a climbing spiral. And the rudder on this plane is actually fairly good, much better than the elevator. It held the spiral long enough to gain over 700 metres of altitude, but at low speed it can't continue the climb and it levels out. But that's impressive power from a stock level plane, and that rudder authority could be quite useful. Over into a dive to test its high speed handling. First looking at the effect of compressibility on its roll rate, which is excellent up to about 600 km an hour IAS, at which it tightens up noticeably, but still fast enough to manoeuvre the plane. The rudder and elevator response is fairly weak though, which will make it difficult to follow a dodging target at these speeds, but it does track the mouse cursor quite smoothly. Up into a steep zoom climb, which is not something I'd typically be doing in a stock tier 4 plane. I'm just getting an idea of how good it is at recovering altitude from a dive. I start at the climb at 700 metres. It gets up to 3000 metres before I'd normally level off, and that's not bad at all. I'll take it up to the point of stall and see how well it performs a hammerhead turn. I'm taking it right up to 3600 metres before it's about to stall, and over we go. And again, it shows that excellent rudder authority, flipping over much quicker than an Anton 190 could do. But again, there's that weak elevator taking forever to lift the nose up and level the plane. Before I take it to battle, let's look at the uh, mods we need to research on this thing. The flight test showed poor turning abilities, but the potential for this to be a superb boom and zoom style interceptor. And even, it even looks like I might be able to do some stall trap energy fighting in a pinch even as a stock plane. But like all energy fighters, you need power and speed, which means researching the flight and survivability components first. The cannon belts are down on level 3, and I'm sorry, but that means we'll be using the default belts for a while. OK, so it's time for some battles. And I'll start with my very first flight in the D9. If you've seen the stock survival video I made on the Firefly F Mark I, you'll recognise this as the same map, and possibly expect a repeat of the 9 kill performance I achieved in that plane. Well, let me tell you now, it's not going to happen, nor should you expect those kind of results from a stock D9. It only has half the cannons of the Firefly, it's fighting against faster and better armoured planes, and the Firefly can dogfight, which gets it a lot of firing opportunities. In the D9, you need to climb, uh, steadily gaining altitude as you keep the plane nice and fast, hanging back behind the battle until you see isolated or preoccupied targets. Your first thought should be to keeping your plane alive. If you misjudge an engagement, you'll be intercepted and shot down. And a dead plane can't score kills, which is what you need to unlock the modules. Forget ideas of going on high kill streaks or of helping your, plane, uh, your team to win the game. That'll come later when the plane's spaded. For now, you have two goals. Training yourself to fly the D9 and researching its upgrades. Nothing else is important. Anyway, back to the action. I've been stalking this isolated Tiffy, but it's taken me a while to close in and now I'm chasing him as he dives. I'm able to land a hit, but he's running toward a cloud of reds, so I'm breaking off and hitting Wep to get away. A friendly Spitfire got tunnel vision and decided to stick with the chase. And you can see what's going to happen to him. Not pretty. 
And that's exactly what we need to avoid doing in the Dora. You need to be patient, keep your plane fast at all times, never turn fight, and prioritise survival above shooting down planes. For, trust me, the kills will come. If a head-on presents itself, as it will here, look to fire from long range, and then snap roll away. Your pilot might be well protected, but your engine is quite flammable, and your wings are made of paper, as we'll see later on. Here I'm going to be cautious again. There's a bit of a furball ahead, and I thought of blowing through to look for an intercept kill and getting away, but my approach takes me toward the enemy fighter spawn, which is quite close, and I'm not travelling that fast, hence I think better of it. Turn away and climb. Things just haven't worked out so far in this game. There's been precious few attacking opportunities that haven't involved substantial risk, and the few shots I've taken have only scored hits. I've pushed forward here again, but there's just too many red fighters, including some with an altitude advantage, no obvious target, so again I'm having to turn and retreat. But this approach looks more promising. There's no fighters above me right at the moment to worry about, and these guys look preoccupied. So I'm entering a shallow dive to gain closing speed. I'm thinking of a shot at either the J2M or the Mozzie. The Mozzie it is. A critical this time. Well, that's an advance over a hit, I suppose. The J2M's climbed out of range, and I don't want him diving at me, so I'm into a dive myself to escape. Just in case. It never hurts to be paranoid, sometimes they really are, out to get you. Now he's joined up there by a Hellcat and the Hellcats decided to dive all the way down into the furball under their fighter spawn. Over there. All those planes look extremely busy. Maybe this will be the opportunity I've been waiting for. Into a shallow dive to gain speed while I track all the enemies in the area there, trying to identify the most promising target. I'm a bit nervous about the P400 flying straight at me from the fighter spawn, so I decide to go for the KR-61 to the left. Except I look around again and see he's already gone. Never mind, I still feel like there's potential targets here. So I'm straight into a Nimbleman, checking first to make sure no enemies are approaching. You should never loop this plane if there's a chance of being intercepted. OK, let's see what we've got. A bunch of new fighters have spawned. Again, my speed is lower than I'd like, plus I'm flying under the spawn altitude. I've got to be careful here. But I've played conservatively for quite a while in this battle, and so far it hasn't paid off, so I'm starting to push my luck a bit. Into a shallow approach dive. I'm looking at either the Corsair or the Dornier. Well, the Dornier's gone, so the Corsair's nice and slow, but I just can't close in fast enough. Welcome to Stock Syndrome. Score another hit, but the elevators aren't strong enough to keep, for me to keep guns on target. But I have some speed up now, so I'm continuing the attack. Head on with the Thunderbolt. Down he goes, and I'll pause it there. That Spitfire's turned back toward his fighter spawn. He's a perfect target, and one I can't refuse, but he's taking me the wrong direction. Down goes my second kill, and now I need to get out of here, but the attack on the Spitfire cost me 100 kilometers an hour, and the minimap shows fighters right on my tail, and rolling from side to side is simply not good enough. Off goes a wing. As I said, mistakes will cost you dearly. Stock D9s simply don't have the speed to run away, if you get it wrong. Here's another example of exactly that. I'm diving to attack a Year 2, with an A6M2 trailing behind it, hoping for a shot at both planes. Year's down, but the Zero's too close. Just fly past and assume I'm safe to run away. But no, the Zero has turned and snapped a shot at me from 500 metres that removes both wings. My mistake was my slight turn to the right before checking on the Zero. From memory I've died four times in this plane, I may as well show all of them now. Night games like this are perfect for a stock D9, provided you stay undetected. I'd scored four kills before a J2M picked me out, and I'm snap rolling to escape his attack. And by the way, that's the best way to evade in this plane. Run and snap roll. But things are a bit hectic, and I try for a shot at this PBJ, then suddenly find a B7A2 has me on toast. I foolishly try to scissors towards him, which seals my fate. And off will go a wing. One more to go, as it's quite instructive. I'd climbed in this battle, met no enemy fighters, so I decided to go bomber hunting. Nice frontal approach here from slightly below. Aim carefully. 
Yep, he's a light. I'm going to dive to escape his gunners. Uh, never mind. Yep, wing chopped off at 600 metres by a 50 cal bullet. Because of the paper wings, I'd simply suggest not attacking bombers at all unless you can be sure of engaging from a blind spot. It only takes one bullet to send you tumbling from the sky. OK, I've shown you enough doom and gloom. Let's look at the highlights from a domination game. In this battle, the enemy held control of high altitude throughout, so I was restricted to flying at around 1500 metres and below. It was a good exercise in situational awareness and the importance of staying fast at all times. By the time I'd played this game, I'd set myself a budget of scoring just a minimum of two kills per game, and obviously doing my best not to lose my plane. Obviously two kills isn't much. It's certainly achievable, and that's the point. I don't want to set the bar so high that I do stupid things that the stock plane really can't handle, and that only get me shot down. No luck on the P-47 there, so I'm smoothly extending away, while keeping as fast as possible, using the opportunity to look around. And it's now that the enemy fighters take control of high altitudes, so I need to be ready to dodge boom and zoom attacks as well. As I'm approaching the battle again, I see the 109 looking to attack a Lancaster above me. I just keep my eye on what he's doing. Then I see that he's far too close for comfort and flip over into a dive, just in case. But no, he's going for the Lancaster, not me, so I loop straight up again, on the chance that the 109 might pull a hard turn and give me a shot at him from underneath. No such luck. He's flown off into the distance, and there's no point chasing him. OK, who to attack? Well, there's a P-63 off to my left, but too far away. A 109 trying to cap B, and an LA-7 flying away from me on my right. So I choose the 109. But he's snuffed out before I get there, so I have to turn around and reset. Patience, patience, patience. Just have to maintain discipline, and the kills will come. OK, ready for my next attempt. I've made, managed to gain 1600 metres this time, which will give me additional speed for my attack. Just accelerating in the shallow dive as I approach the enemy. There's a small bunch of them dogfighting over there. A few other fighters inbound from their spawn. Let's see if I can pick someone off here. So many potential targets. It can be confusing. If I'd held back though, I might have had a shot at that Stuka capping bee. Ah oh well. Right, it's down to the 190 of the Corsair. The Corsair it is. Whew, it's about as close as you can get without ramming. Now into a very gentle turn, hitting WEP to keep my speed high. I'm making sure not to pull any G-forces here at all, as speed is my greatest and only asset. I can't afford to waste it. First priority is to make sure I'm not under attack, and yes, I'm clear. I see an I-185 isolated at B. And because I kept my speed up, I have the option to engage him. And there we go. I'm on the scoreboard with kill number one. I'm sticking to the same simple strategy of pushing forward to attack at high speed and then extending away. No turn fighting under any circumstances. No hard maneuvers of any kind. Nothing fancy at all. OK, there's a 109 and a P-51 here. Which shall it be? The 109 looks the most promising. I hold fire until it's lined up perfectly, and there's the second kill. And with any luck, I'd have taken out the LA-9 ahead of me there as I extended away. But it's not to be. So I've achieved my goal, and any more kills I get before the end will be a bonus. And as my team had control of the airfields throughout, uh, this battle was a fairly quick one. I only had time for one last attack before it was over. As I approach, I'm rolling to adjust to his turns, and when he dives toward me, I can line him up for a close range shot. And there's my third kill, right before the end of the battle. So far I've used uh, simply the speed of the plane as my main weapon in relatively flat attacking runs, but even as a stock plane it's capable of doing more if the situation calls for it. There's a couple of bombers down there just asking to be boom and zoomed, but there's also a Yak-3 climbing up at me. Now, I could have just gone at him head-on, but I knew he was low on energy because he'd just finished dogfighting someone, hence I'd lifted into a shallow climb with Webb. I'm looking carefully for any indication that he might be struggling, and sure enough he begins to lose ground, so for the first time in the video, I'm performing a rudder turn to circle behind him and set up the kill. Ah, 
and then I continued the dive to engage one of the bombers. I look at the Dornier, but eventually decide the angle's too sharp, and choose the IL-10 instead. And then I continue the dive, and then as usual I'm extending back to safety with a high speed, shallow climb. Now in many games there'll be enemies that will outclimb you, and force you to a low altitude roll, and the stock door is a poor plane for taking on fighters that have an altitude advantage. But sometimes your team wins the battle for high altitude, and you can use the D9 in a fighter suppression roll. Which is, ex which is extremely good at, even in stock form. There's two climbers here, an I-185 and the 190 I just shot down. I'm extending into the zoom climb knowing the 185 will be chasing me. And there he is, hurling red stuff in my direction, but I'm easily outrunning him. The question is whether I'll be able to engage him in some kind of stall fighting manoeuvre. To do that I'd need a clear altitude and energy advantage, enough to let me turn back toward him without risking a spray from his guns. I'm getting low on speed as I pass 5,000 metres, so I decide to level off and let the plane accelerate. Then a friendly P-51 decides the matter by shooting the 185 down. Never mind, I'm sure he'll be back. And there he is, clawing for altitude in a Yak-3. And it's a very simple matter of rolling into the dive for a very easy kill. The battle was winding down very quickly and we had total control of high altitude, but sometimes you meet players who persist in trying to climb, no matter the situation. Hence I was on the lookout for Gers, and when he reappeared, I saw him turn directly into the cloud behind their spawn point. There's only one thing he could be doing back there, using the clouds as cover while he climbed. So I decided to shadow him, eventually saw the dot in the clouds that could only be his plane, and then dived to engage when he appeared. And what I'm demonstrating here is not beating up on some poor guy who's trying to climb, rather showing off the stock D9's superb high-speed handling, acceleration in a dive and above-average zoom climb ability. Suppressing climbers like this also provides you with nice steady targets that are quite easy to hit, which overcomes the sparkling you often get from using the default ammo belts. When you do get control of high altitude like this, just be very careful when you engage bombers, and it's probably best to leave the B-17s to someone else. To finish, I'll show you some footage from one last battle. I've climbed to the side at high speed, the enemy fighters at altitude are starting to appear on my left, and the merge is underway. I'm mostly concerned with the high B7A2, who eventually dives a little as if to engage our fighters, then seems to have second thoughts. I turn towards him, preparing to open up at long range if he goes for a head-on, but he wants none of that and decides to dive away. So I shadow him in a shallow dive of my own. If he decides to climb again, then I'll use the speed from the dive to intercept. But no, he's going to keep diving all the way to ground level. Another B-17's appeared. There's an LA-5 behind me at altitude, but the friendly fighter should take care of him. And a second B-7A-2 has spawned in. Don't want him to see me as a threat, as then he might simply dive away like the first B-7A-2, so I've turned to the bright. And this also ensures I stay out of range of the B-17's gunners. I'll leave him for the mob of friendly fighters behind me. Into the shallow dive now, and I turn a little toward him. I want to get into position to attack from underneath. I'm trying to sneak up without him realising it, until it's too late. OK, he's still flying straight and level, so I begin a climbing attack. And despite doing all I could to maximise my speed, I'm slowing down quickly. It seems to take forever to close the range. Of course I'm flying a stock plane, after all. And my initial volley has failed to shoot him down. He's about to go evasive. I fire short bursts, waiting for him to pull a sharp turn and expose his wings, which he did, and that gave me the opening I was waiting for. A little later, later I noticed he'd respawned in an A6M5, and yes, he's climbing straight up at me, almost certainly out for revenge. I have a huge energy advantage over him, both in speed and altitude. But there's no harm flying across his path from above, in order to encourage him to climb a little harder and slow down even more. A rudder turn, which becomes a wing over as I feel it's time to dive and attack. Hitting wet to accelerate, I want to close in quickly before he has time to dodge. Looks like a perfect boom and zoom here, except there's just a little recoil from the cannons which lifts the nose, and he rolled his plane at the last moment, so my shots go high. A fully upgraded Dora would have had much greater acceleration in the dive, 
closing into firing range earlier and getting the kill before the Zero had a chance to dodge. Anyway, I've easily pulled away from him into the zoom climb, especially as he had to make a 180 degree turn to follow me, so now it's just a matter of preserving my energy advantage and setting up another attack. And I was just about to start another dive when a blue Spitfire saw the Zero hanging there and helped himself to an easy kill. Such is life. Spitfire then flew straight into the enemy fighter spawn and started to furball, which of course made it unlikely that anyone else would try to climb. However, as I circled above I saw that he was attempting to disengage through a zoom climb, so as quickly as possible I dropped into a dive in the hope of picking the chasers off his tail. Once again though it wasn't to be. Before I got there the Spitfire decided to flip over and dive, taking the chasers with him. I fought the recoil and weak elevators in an effort to get guns on this Spitfire, but only managed to hit. And now I'm at their fighter spawn altitude myself and I need to climb. The climb easily carried me all the way back to bomber altitude and still the dogfight at the fighter spawn was raging. I'm thinking of another boom and zoom when suddenly I noticed a P-63 climbing below me. And unlike the other planes he isn't engaging the dogfighting Spitfire, so I fly across him and then dive to attack. He sees me coming, turns underneath my angle of approach. Well, okay then. Once more I'm at fighter spawn altitude and had to do, I needed to zoom climb, and checking behind me, yes, it looks like he's trying to follow. I have just enough energy to Wimbledon, which I wouldn't suggest attempting at a starting speed of less than 400 km an hour IAS. And that brings me back in his direction to cross his path once more, and you can see he's really climbing hard now. So once again I attempt the, uh, the diving attack, as he must be very low on speed. He immediately pulls to the side and downwards, and then spiral dives as I send a few shots in his direction. Again gently up into the zoom climb, though I do pull a few more G's than I'd like. And is the P-63 still chasing me? Yes, there he is, below on the right of screen. Evidently I'm going to have to try a different tactic, as he's too clever to be surprised by a normal boom and zoom attack. So, I'm going to climb gently, and as I do so I'll gradually start turning to the right. I'm just waiting a moment till Wep comes back online. Okay. Up into the gradual climb, and periodically I'll just turn a bit further to the right. The idea is to allow the range between us to decrease. However, the vertical difference between our planes will increase bit by bit, as will the difference in our trajectories. So from his point of view, he'll feel like he's gaining on me and holds the advantage, when in reality I'm starving him of energy, and in the end it'll be impossible for him to lift his nose in order to get the guns on target. Now he's straining to get that shot. He just can't do it. While I still have plenty of speed, and can run it over to attack him while he's nearly stalled. And the beauty of that manoeuvre is that the P-63 was trying for a gun solution until the very end, and by the time he realised the danger he was in, I'd already opened fire. It was too late for him to escape. It really shows what the stock D9's capable of as well, that it could pull that off. So I guess it's time I should summarise. When flying a stock D9, start out with a modest target of just a few kills per game, and aim for simple intercept attacks at high speed. Avoid hard manoeuvres of any kind, and be as gentle as you can with the mouse as well. As your speed is precious, you must take care not to waste it needlessly. Don't dogfight in this plane, you'll only be shot down. If you must take head-ons, fire at extreme range and then go evasive. If you hold the head-on, chances are you'll be shot down. Be very careful of bomber gunners, give them a fraction of a chance and you guessed it, you'll be shot down. And once you're shot down, you can't score any more kills in that game in the D9, and kills are what you need in order to research its upgrades. Oh, and if your first few attack runs don't work out, be patient and maintain your discipline. The kills will come. One more boom and zoom kill here on the B7A2 and A6M5 pilot from earlier, still climbing up looking for revenge. Ok, here's my service record in the plane so far. As you can see it's the first tier 4 German plane that I've flown. 11 flights, 4 deaths and 26 kills, so I'm achieving ahead of my goal of 2 kills per game. In fact in my last few games I was delving into the 3 and 4 kill figures, so I became more comfortable with the plane as I went. 
Here's what I've unlocked in those flights, flying without premium and with only a 15% RP booster. Fuselage repair, radiator and the 13mm belts, and yes I should have left those belts alone and researched the compressor instead. Each of these modules require 3,900 research points, so that's nearly 12,000 points gained in those 11 battles where I flew conservatively and actually had quite a long streak of bad luck. Looking at the other modules, another 27,000 points will unlock the remaining flight and survivability upgrades. And seeing I racked up 12,000 so easily, I really can't see this being a problem at all, particularly as the plane becomes more effective with each upgrade. And what's more, I found this plane really enjoyable to fly, and I can see how it's going to be an absolute monster once it's spaded up. So if you own a D9, and you've been holding off on flying it, I suggest you stop watching YouTube videos and take that plane out of mothballs. With this particular Tier 4 fighter, stock syndrome isn't really that much of a problem. The grind might be shorter than you think. I have many other stock syndrome uh, survival videos in the works. Next up will be either the Tempest Mark V or the i 185 m 71 Though of course, if you're watching this a month or two after I posted this vid, those guides will already be online waiting for you, and probably others as well. The best place to find them is the Stock Syndrome Survival Playlist, a link to which is now on your screen if you have annotations enabled. But that's all I have for this video. It's gone a bit longer than I expected, but I hope the footage I included is helpful. This is Longshot signing off. Until my next vid, I'll see you in the skies.